Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, welcome back. So, uh, in today's lecture, we are going to study about long term memory. This is a part of memory which has been discussed in the Atkinson Schiffen model, and this is the kind of memory uh, that people, when they colloquially or when a layman talks about memory, this is the kind of memory that they talk about. So, what we are going to do in uh, today's lecture is we will look into uh, this kind of a memory. So, basically most retrievals uh, that you have any kind of information that you think of storing any kind of life event knowledge, any kind of facts, uh, any kind of uh, mathematical rule or any other kind of information which you th uh, think is stored in your uh, mind or brain is basically what is stored in the long term memory. So, let us then look at uh, what is long term memory and in this particular section we will look into uh, basic processes of long term memory as in how it is formed and what are the basic processes and kind of retrieval and all and the upcoming couple of lectures we will look into different kinds of long term memory. Now, continuing from uh, what we saw in the last class, I discussed about something called Atkinson and Schiffen's model. Uh, so, Atkinson and Schiffen model or the information pro uh, processing model talks about a system uh, which has a three parts into it a three part system. So, what we have is a setup like this and this is called the sensei register. Uh, in the last series of last lectures we saw what is sensei register and how does it work and what are the uh, various properties of the sensei register. So, basically any information which comes out or which comes in or gets processed through the perceptual and attentional processes basically arrive at the sensei register and it has a huge capacity in very uh, short duration of time. And then we have something called the short term store. Uh, this is another thing that we talked about in our last lecture. This is the kind of system which holds information for uh, brief periods of time not very brief, but brief periods of time, but it can hold uh, only limited information and we saw an extension of this uh, concept called the working memory in our last class. So, working memory is basically an improvement of the short term store, because it talks about a system which has uh, more capacity than as was discussed in the Atkinson and Schiffen model. And obviously, the last thing that we did not discuss, the last part we did not discuss was the LTM or the long term memory. This is the store which holds most of the information, even the working memory as we saw the capacity working memory executive systems, uh, which basically make decisions uh, for the working memory system, they through the episodic buffer connect to this long term store. So, this long term store then holds up most of the information. Now, the Atkinson and Schrifin model just uh, just does not talk about this kind of uh, uh, box and arrow structure, but they also talk about processes and so these processes are the ones which actually go ahead and transfer information. So, here the process here is the attentional processes, but uh, so I will write attention allocation here. So, that is the process which takes in information from the sensory register and moves it to the short term store. And once information is in the short term store, it is basically the rehearsal process which moves information from the short term store to the long term store. So, the number of rehearsals that you do, the number of repetitions uh, that you do of an information, the number of times you use an information, it basically goes to something called the long term store, it gets stored here. Now, the long term store is not an active store as we discussed in terms of the short term store. We saw the working memory concept describe the short term store as an active store. So, it, it can do a lot of stuff, it can uh, move around a lot of stuff, it can do a lot of activity, but the long term store does not do any activity. It is just like a 
kind of storehouse which is there. So, information are there a number of information is stored here it is stored in a highly organized and categorized format, but there is no action as such which basically means that things cannot be acted upon. If a particular rule or if a particular information needs some action on it some kind of an action has to be done on this information it has to come back to the short term store the working memory store and the process which moves information from the long term store to back to the short term store is basically called the retrieval process. So, basically then we will look into this part this whole part in this lecture. Now, the question is what is the existence or evidence for existence of this long term store. So, again let us look quickly look into the idea of serial position curve. Now, what was the uh, uh, experiment for uh, looking at the serial position curve? The experiment was that a list is given to people to actually go ahead and read and once you read this list you are asked to retrieve it back and as you retrieve it back what tends to happen is a curve like this is shown in terms of retrieval. So, if I look at percentage accuracy of recall which is on this side and this is the item numbers on the list what I tend to see is that items which are recent tend to be retrieved more and items which are at the beginning of the list tends to be retrieved more whereas items in the middle of the list are not retrieved. And so, this effect was called this was called the primacy effect and this is called the recency effect and very popular theory we have discussed this before. Now, this basically experiment shows that and the re, uh, that there has there has to be two systems of memory there has to be two stores of memory. The reason why is that in the items which have been learned at the beginning of the list they receive a number of repetitions and so they are retrieved back better is because this goes to a LTM store a store which stores information a kind of structure in the brain which stores information for longer durations of time. And experiments were done where it was found out that the primacy effect items which show primacy effect were remembered for longer duration of time. Why? Because it was processed. Think of you uh, doing the list what happens is the first item comes in. So, second item pops in. So, we repeat the first item and the second item third item pops in you repeat the first item the second item the third item and so the number of repetitions that the first item actually goes through or it receives is n factorial times. So, the kind of uh, the list items is there and make a factorial of that and that is the kind of repetitions it receives. So, with more number of repetitions you are prone to more number of uh, uh, more processing and so shifting to a store. So, this basically here this diagram here shows you that there are two different kind of stores and this is the short term store and this is the long term store. Now, another interesting thing is that as we saw that the short term store which is basically then improved into the working memory store uh, that is divided into its central executive, the phonological loop, the visio, special sketch pad and the episodic memory. Similarly, the long term store has or the long term memory has several subdivisions. So, we look into the subdivision in the uh, in as we move pro uh, progress through this and each of this subdivision we are going to look at or we are going to study one by one. So, in the upcoming lectures we will look into all of these stores. So, basically there are two subdivisions of it one is called the declarative part and the other is called the procedural part. So, basically the long term store in itself is divided into two stores there is a lot of debate we will also look at the debate of what are the declarative and procedural part is, but basically the difference is declarative is that part or the declarative is that type of long term memory which you when you retrieve back you are conscious about it. So, a task like thinking about your first birthday I am pretty sure that you cannot remember your first birthday that, but uh, let us say your 12th class farewell or things like that. Now, another interesting thing why you cannot remember your first birthday is because there is something called childhood amnesia. We will talk about amnesia at the end of this section, but right now that is the reason that I am just giving you the reason. So, basically conscious things which you are aware of when you are 
thinking about it or when you are retrieving it is what is the declarative knowledge and procedural knowledge is those knowledge which are unconscious. So, you are basically unconscious or you do not know that you are retrieving it. For example, uh, mostly I give this example in my class is riding a bicycle. So, how do you teach someone to ride a bicycle? So, even if I ask you to give me how do you ride a bicycle, it is very difficult for you to show how do you ride a bicycle and so there are two different parts. Now, within this declarative and procedural part, you have within the declarative part, you have something called the semantic type and the episodic type of memory. We look into these two types of memory, semantic stores, world knowledge. So, basically facts, rules, truths and those kind of thing and episodic is that kind of knowledge which is basically related to a episode which is basically related to some kind of event in your life. Procedural basically there are four subdivisions, but we will uh, not look in detail into the procedural part of memory. Uh, so, uh, I will just give you a brief overview of what can come here. So, you have basically uh, things which are learned from classical conditioning, things like habits right and so this kind of uh, uh, structure is there and also priming. Priming is another thing which comes under uh, procedural memory. So, things priming is basically a instance or it is basically a, a phenomena in which uh, if you want to if you want to identify or if you if you are given the task of perceiving an object just before perception of an object uh, some uh, information some very brief information is given to you and that brief information leads you to uh, basically um, remember or basically recognize that uh, object that is called priming so basically uh, think of it in this way so, uh, when you are going to meet someone, before you meet someone, somebody gives you some kind of information about that person and that makes you quickly identify that person. Now, this information which has been given to you is basically called priming and similarly, there are two type of priming, one is called semantic priming, the other is called uh, perceptual priming, uh, but we will uh, come to that when we come to that particular exercise, but right now this is what it is. So, let us then start the usual uh, things, let us start looking into the usual thing of uh, long term memory. So, what we have done up till now is we have established that there is something called long term memory and we have also established that this long term memory has some kind of uh, uh, setup which is there which we will look into the upcoming lectures. So, basically then in this particular lecture we will look into the retrieval and encodings on long term memory. So, basically long term memory it is basically described as a place for storage of large amount of information and as you know uh, from philosophical uh, viewpoints this has been uh, quoted as a scrape book of memories or a treasure chest. So, basically it has been thought of a place like a box or a chest which can store a large amount of information. So, that is what the conceptualization of long term memory is and these are all philosophical conceptualization. Now, the question arises what is the capacity of LTM? So, there have been several experiments which have been done and so generally speaking the long term memory has a huge it is it has sometimes it is called that it has infinite. Uh, capacity. Why? Because whatever you know up till now, whatever you have learned up till now in your life and till the point you die, it will all be stored in long term memory. So, basically meaning that most information that you know in your life is in long term memory. So, again the, uh, uh, the evidence here is that long term memory has an infinite storage. So, basically, but there have been some attempts to find out what is the uh, capacity of this long term store and so look at uh, let us look at this evidence. So, Thomas Lander he tried to provide an answer by making two basic estimate. One estimate is the cerebral cortex has 10 to the power 13 uh, 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 synapses and so what synapses are if you look at a neuron any neuron which is there and these neurons they connect to each other through uh, an empty space. So, basically this is the neuron, this is the dendrite of a neuron, dendrites are those portions of a neuron which help in communicating. So, these are two dendrites which communicate with each other and they communicate through both an electric uh, an electrical messenger and a chemical messenger. So, chemical messengers are stored here, but uh, this is something which comes into the biology of memory and so uh, let us not uh, get into that particular framework, but then this synapse is 
the space between these two dendrites which are there. And so, basically this space allows uh, chemical messengers or basically substances which are called neurotransmitters to basically move from one uh, neuron to another. So, if this is the neuron which is transmitting and this is the neuron which is receiving information is passed through the synapse. So, synapse is there that particular um, space a void which is there and it is very important in uh, looking at how memory is formed. So, there is a whole idea of how memory is stored, what is the way it is stored and biological uh, basis of memory says that there is something called phenomena is called long term potentiation and long term depression which is how memories are stored, but we will not discuss on to that, we will quickly look into this. So, this, this empty voids or spaces are what are called uh, synapses and so uh, Thomas Landier he found out that there were 10 to the power 13 synapses in the uh, in, in cerebral cortex and which is the number of information which is stored in the brain. So, he basically equated it that one particular synapse is trained for only one kind of information and so, if it is 10 to the power 13 then it is 10 to the power 13 bits of information which is stored huge number. Now, another estimate was made as that there are 10 to the power 20 bits of information which is the number of neural transmission made by an average human lifetime. And so, this particular deduction is made on the basis of the fact that the li there is a life of human beings and the life of a neuron and based on the life of the neuron and the life of the human being, it is estimated through computational uh, calculations uh, which uh, show that 10 to the power 20 bits of information pass on from uh, one neuron to the another or that is the number of connections a neuron actually uh, number of neurons which are there uh, they make. And so, this is the kind of information or this is the kind of uh, capacity of LTM, but then most of them are gen generically in uh, an, an estimate of it and as I said in generic speaking it has infinite capacity. Now, the question is how does it uh, account for this infinite capacity. So, basically think of uh, the archiving program that you have in your computer. So, you, you have either a WinRAR or you have uh, something like um, uh, uh, some other uh, I, I do not know the names of a lot of uh, those archiving systems, but then you have these systems or you have these programs which help you to compress file. Now, similar system helps uh, is there in long term memory what it does is it compresses file but then it uses certain features which are very advanced features. So, what, what it does is first it selects what information has to be stored and based on that it also compresses information and then it provides a key to this compression. So, let us look at how information is stored and how information is retrieved, the duration and all those things in the next few uh, uh, slides. So, basically another question is we saw that the coding that happens, the way information is stored in short term memory was acoustic in nature. And so, there was a very good experiment which was uh, there, which was done by Bradley. And so, Bradley showed that if acoustic words were used, if two different kind of information was fed into uh, short term memory and both were acoustic in nature, uh, in the sense that either they had the same phonology which basically means the same speech sound and another ones which did not have the same speech sound, the confusion was more for those words which had the same speech sound. So, P and D were confused more, P, D, E confused more than P and K kind of a thing. And so, basically that experiment showed us or basically uh, told us that uh, the kind of uh, uh, storage that happens in long term memory is basically uh, acoustic. Now, what is the format in which it is stored in long term memory? So, basically uh, this is in terms of again Bradley did an experiment and found out that this is in terms of semantic nature. So, what was the experiment? So, what Alan Bradley did was he gave two groups, first he selected two groups of people. For one group he gave similar sounding word, for example, map, mad and men to people for remembering and then he gave another words from the same list. So, he gave people two group of people two different leads, uh, lists to remember. Now, there are two versions of the list. In one version of the list what happened is people were given similar sounding words to remember for example, uh, hen, had, ha, heck kind of a thing or map madman as he are written here and in the other list you had. Uh, 
words from the same list the presentation list but then these words were not similar sounding so you have things like pen day ring because they don't sound similar and this was to create acoustic confusion and in the group b people were given same meaning words so you see here what happened is you have the huge word the big word and the great word all of them have the same meaning so it's like a synonym so synonym generally more synonyms were given and then another list was created where people were given words which uh, didn't have similar meaning so it had different meaning for example foul old and deep here and uh, recall was done after 20 minutes participants were engaged in unrelated tasks so the task was basically n back counting so an n back counting task was used now what is an n back counting task we showed you in the last uh, uh, lecture in the brown peterson task n back counting is basically a task in which you count back n units so 1000 and if you have to count three units back it will be 997 uh, 994 kind of a thing and so this is n back you have to keep on counting back and so this is what the n back task is all about and so people did this kind of a task this was given so that they should this kind of a task should take up all their uh, available attentional resources so that uh, the rehearsal is not uh, allowed or rehearsal is not given. So, a 20 minute uh, wait was done and after that uh, when experimenters were or the subjects were asked to retrieve back acoustic similarity produced very little effect on performance as well as semantic similarity. So, when words which were similar where they were presented or they were shown to people 20 minutes is enough time for any item to get processed. So, when this kind of retrieval was done it was found out that in this people in group A there was no difference. So, there was no difference between people who were given map, map and man uh, to remember, but then more confusions were seen on people who were given similar meaning word. And so, this experiment basically demonstrates the fact that these words which had similar meaning that was what was creating confusion. And this experiment also shows that the kind of uh, manner or the manner in which information is stored in long term memory is basically in terms of uh, semantics or in terms of meaning. Another uh, reason or another thing for the existence of uh, semantic evidence I would say for the existence of semantic memory is basically this is called uh, uh, Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. So, what is the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve and how did it arrive? So, I explained to you in, in uh, earlier lecture that Ebbinghaus was a German uh, psychologist and he was testing his limits to memory of how much uh, thing he can remember, how much uh, items he can remember and for how long a time. But if he tried to remember words uh, from a list, then there would be some uh, a long term memory or there would be some bias into it. So, what he did was he created a CVC, a consonant vowel consonant kind of a trigam. He called this as a trigam. So, this trigam was, so let us say X, V and uh, Q. Now, X, V, Q does not mean anything, but P, A, T would mean. Uh, something or pat or C A T would be cat. So, these have meaning words and these is a trigram. So, this kind of a trigram was there. He took a lot of trigrams, he remembered them and he then retrieved the, these back over periods of time. This is a very simple demonstration, a very simple uh, uh, thing. A uh, very simple result from his experiment. What he saw that the percentages of mean saving and versus the retention interval what happened is the as inputted arrived around 31 days after 31 days people still remembered this 20 percent of items from the list so even when he did experiments he uh, found out that uh, from the list that he remembered 20 percent of item were still with him he was able to retrieve this 20 percent of item even after 30 days or 31 days and which kept on going for a number of more days so, basically meaning that there is a store which allows you to store this information for longer duration of time and that also this idea that you do not get forgetting or do not forget after this long duration is basically another evidence for the existence of a store which stores information for longer duration time with more rehearsal. So, what happens is as time passes the you do not tend to uh, forget more and this is an evidence for long term memory. So, let us do a quick review of a long term memory. So, basically the question here is retrieval transfers information from long term to short term memory as I showed to you and forgetting is the inability to uh, basically retrieve information from uh, memory. And so, we people often talk about forgetting. 
Now, forgetting from short term memory is very obvious because items uh, get stored for 20 second and so we cannot think of forgetting as a forgetting here and there. Again, we looked at how does this forgetting happen. So, in the last class, we looked at the Brown Peterson ta task and the Vaughan and Norman task, and both of them said that there is a decay uh, kind of a thing and interference kind of a phenomena which basically leads to forgetting from short term memory. So, let us look at why do we people forget from long term memory, how do we forget things from long term memory. So, is there something called forgetting from long term memory or if something is encoded into long term memory does it stay there forever. So, let us look at that quickly. So, basically this is how it works. So, this is the sensory memory, this is the working or short term memory information is rehearsed here and then it is passed to long term memory from the long term memory it is retrieved back as and when it is wanted back to long term memory. So, why do people forget? There are several forgetting theories which have been proposed for long term memory and let us look at some of these theories. So, some of the theories which have been proposed for forgetting from long term memory is something called the poor encoding theory, the decay theory, the interference theory and the retrieval queue theory. So, some of these theories are what you find. So, basically the decay and interference theory is what also applies to the short term store, but then for the long term store you have two additional theories. So, let us look at these theories one by one. So, let us look at the first theory. First theory says that forgetting happens from long term memory because people never encoded that. So, it could have happened that a piece of information was given to you and you never encoded that information and that could be one of the reason why forgetting happened and that could be one of the fact why forgetting happened. It could be that uh, you never know. For example, if I ask you the question uh, where is the tilde key in your uh, uh, computer keyboard. So, people who have not used the tilde key it they have now never encoded where the tilde key is or where is the function key. So, people who type some people who never use the function key they will never know because they never encoded it and that is called the encoding failure theory. So, information which is never encoded into LTM is called uh, the reason for it. Uh, there is a short term memory information never passed from the short term memory into the long term memory. So, no encoding and that is the reason for encoding uh, failure here. So, some examples are uh, what let us accompany the number 5 on your telephone if that is what is given to you. So, most of you I mean these days you have these uh, uh, newer smartphones which do not have these numbers with it, but uh, the push button phones that were that were there it had to be had a number of a number written 3 uh, digits or 3 letters which were written after every digit. So, if that is the question most people would not have ever thought about that right and so you do not tend to remember or where is the number 0 on your calculator if this question is asked most people uh, do use it and so it is become so procedural or so automatic as we saw in attentional theories that the thing becomes so automatic the pressing 0 becomes so automatic that it is very difficult for you to know where it is or so according to this theory objects seen frequently, but never uh, but information was never encoded into LTM and that is one reason for forgetting from LTM. Another reason why people tend to forget another theory which proposes forgetting from long term store is called the retrieval the, uh, failure theory. So, what does this theory say? So, it says that not all forgetting is due to encoding failure. Some of the uh, forgetting is due to retrieval failure also. So, uh, on one poor encoding theory the first theory says that it was not encoded, but then the next three theories talk about retrieval failure something happens at the time of the retrieval getting information back from long term store and that must be the reason why this kind of a forgetting really happens. So, let us look at those theories. So, sometimes information is encoded in LTM, but it does not come back and so you see this is short term memory encoding is done, but it does not come back so, this is called the retrieval failure leading to forgetting. So, what are the theories there or what are the some uh, common examples there? One common example is tip or tongue phenomena, the TOT phenomena is called tip or tongue. Now, there are times in your life when you know that you know information for example, uh, movie song is coming up and so you are there looking at it, you know the actress's name, you know that which letter it starts from, you know uh, which uh, heroes she has worked with, when uh, which movie she has worked with, but suddenly there is a freeze and the name does not come to your mouth and this is called that 
tip or thumb phenomena what happens is that you are not able to retrieve that and that is called retrieval failure. Also cannot retrieve information uh, that you absolutely know is stored in your memory because you know the first name of this actress you know whom she worked with a lot of information which basically means that there is somewhere also the name stored but you are not able to retrieve it and example I have given. So, evidence of forgetting as an inability to retrieve information why we cannot retrieve information that is what we are going to see. So, three theories from the retrieval uh, failure section one is the decay theory, the interference theory and the retrieval Q theory. So, let us start with the decay theory first and so what does the decay theory actually says? The decay theory this is basically the average percentage of information retrieved and this is the interval between original learning of nonsense syllables and memory test which is basically some something like event or C V C kind of a paradigm. So, he looked at trigams and this is the uh, curve which is there. So, basically decay theory says that memories fade away or decay gradually if unused. So, if some memory is not used for a period of time it decays and there is a biological explanation to that also we will come to the biological explanation in a while, but that is what uh, it is. So, if you do not use information which is stored in your memory then there would be a problem and this is something which we are seeing nowadays. What has happened is the Google has taken up so much of our information, Google has taken up so much of our life that we do not try to retrieve information. Even if we need some bits of information what we tend to do is we tend to look into Google, we type that and we get an information and voila it is there. So, basically that is a problem. So, we do not use it and so I always keep on telling this to my students that please use information. If you do not use information it will decay out and one of the fact is the time. How much time is spent between learning and retrieving the information that is one of the reasons of how this particular um, theory works. So, time plays a critical role. Now, ability to retrieve info or uh, declines with time after original encoding. So, as more and more time happens and you are not retrieving this information decay will decay will lead to forgetting. So, let us say at some point of time when you learn something. So, there is a, uh, a bit of uh, knowledge that you learn or Sanskrit for example, if you learn Sanskrit in your uh, 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 in your earlier classes in class 7, 8 have not used it because you did not follow it you tend to forget some as or things like um, uh, some other uh, grammar of Sanskrit. You do not uh, tend to uh, remember how the sandhi is made that is basically conjugation of sentences how it is done in uh, Sanskrit. So, basically that is what uh, happened as time passes on information is never used and so you tend to forget it. So, basically this is what the decay theory is. So, basically decay theory is a biological based theory and so it gives a reason why decay really happens. And what is the reason? The reason which has been provided is that when new memories are formed it creates a memory trace a change in the structure of the brain chemistry. As a new memory is formed from the neurobiology of memory you will come to know that as a new memory is formed what happens is new connections are developed. And so, when new connections are developed what happens is there are number the new dendrites get attached to each other and information passes or one neuron gets connected to multiple neurons. But what happens is if you do not use this uh, connections it will wither away the brain chemistry will take it away. So, if un unused normal brain metabolic activities will erode these connections. These connections which have been formed between two uh, neuronal junctions or two dendrites these connections will erode away because they are not talking to each other. So, two neurons should be talking to each other only then a connection is there. But if this talking stops somehow the neurotransmitter if it stops passing between two junctions the receptor two receptor neurons what will happen is or some change in metabolic activity within the synapse happens this leads to forgetting. For example, one of the um, interesting thing is known uh, is, is uh, which is evident is dopamine deficiencies or dopamine deficiencies in D 1, D 3, D 5 kind of a structure. So, these are three receptor types on a particular uh, on particular neurons and so when uh, lack of dopamine happens here then people show tendencies which are very similar to neurotic people and so this kind of a thing happens. So, if you do not use any connection for a longer period of time it will be there away. Think of it in terms of uh, 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 a, a, a railway store or railway warehouse. So, in olden days people there is these railway warehouse used to be somewhere and so you would see railway lines uh, basically passing through roads, but then as time has progressed nobody uses those railway lines or old stations 
or old junctions which are there and so it withers out nobody remembers it and there is uh, nobody cares about it for example the new york, uh, new york central station below that there is another station which is there it's a popular thing which is there and so there is a whole new, uh, network out there but nobody uses it anymore and so it decays and similarly uh, the brain also decays the information from the brain also decays by not bit getting used so theory not widely favored today in today's world we do not uh, follow this theory because uh, there are certain brain chemistries which say that this kind of degeneration does not happen in the brain. Then you have the interference theories and what does the interference theory say? So, memories interfering with another memories is the reason for forgetting. So, why do we forget? We forget because one kind of memory interfere with another kind of memory. Now, we looked at what is interference and we looked at how does it happen. So, what happens is that if two items which are very similar fairly similar together are brought together uh, brought uh, in close proximity to each other one will interfere with the other or one will uh, compete with the other. So, uh, there is something uh, there, there is something called uh, uh, a fan effect which has been explained by Anderson for this kind of interference. So, uh, Anderson and Nele uh, 1996 they did this work on how interference really works. So, they, what they uh, looked at is that any retrieval queue points to a particular target. This is how they looked at. So, if this is a retrieval queue or this is how you retrieve something it, it, it points to a target, but then assuming that another target is added to it which is similar in nature this retrieval queue then is shared between these two targets. And so, if more number of competitions are generated what will happen is an interference will happen because this retrieval queue C 1 is now queuing these targets T 1, T 2 and T 3. And so, what will happen is when C 1 is activated one neuron is activated or one junction is activated now they are not uniquely connected what will happen is all of these targets will get activated and they will interfere with the uh, with the processing of one. Now, forgetting not caused by mere passage of time. So, this theory basically says that forgetting is not basically due to passage of time is caused by one or more competing with or replacing other memory. So, the definition the thing that I showed you what, what will happen is multiple targets will compete with each other. So, as soon as this queue is activated this targets will compete with each other. The more similar they are the more chances that they will not be retrieved because similarity is one way of how information is retrieved. So, if let us say there are how is the conceptualization of working memory there are different bin bags or think of it in the uh, there are different kind of structures out there. And so, structures which have similar kind of uh, 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 structures which have uh, similar kind of features are put into this bin bag. We will look into that and when we talk about semantic memory. And so, what will happen if, if uh, information which are of similar type they compete with each other what will happen is that they will not be processed. So, it is caused by one more competing with or replacing another memory. So, if similar items are there they will compete with each other and so they will not be able to retrieve it. There are two types of interference to look at one is called the proactive interference and the other is called the re retroactive interference and a very simple paradigm explains it. So, let us assume that an experimental group a group is given to learn a list a b and uh, and while they are doing that a control group is given an unrelated activity to do. After a while the same group both the groups are now given a list a c to learn. So, a b is a list basically a b is a paired associate list. So, you have how what is a paired associate list in a paired associate list you have something called a q target kind of a, uh, a setup in q target what you have is. So, let us say if we have goat and uh, we have leaf here the goat is what is presented to you the leaf is what you have to remember and this is called the pad associate. So, a pairing between goat and leaf is done and this is called the q and this is called the target. So, in the while learning you will learn goat leaf, but while retrieving I will show you goat and you have to learn leaf. Now, we have done this uh, earlier on in attentional theory and in perception also as a part of perception also where we showed. Uh, basically in perception automaticity of perception where we showed how automaticity really works. So, basically in this paradigm then what happens is at a later period of time you are given to learn list a c. Now, when that happens control group shows no interference, but then since list a b and list a c has a in common. So, this will interfere with each other and so the learning of a uh, uh, the learning of a c after a b creates 
so uh, uh, this kind of a uh, interference and this is called proactive interference. So, here since no list was done the learning of a b creates interference with learning of a c and that is what the proactive interference is all about. In retroactive interference paradigm what you have is both groups learn list a b and a b, but group 2 learn a c and group the control group does not learn anything. And so, what happens here is this a c list the learning of this particular list it interferes with the learning of the earlier list and that is what retroactive and proactive interference is. Let us quickly look into what these really mean. So, when a new memory interferes with remembering of old information this is called retroactive interference. Example is when a new phone number interferes with the ability to remember your old number. So, let us say you are uh, you have changed your sim card you have changed your number and when some digits in the old number. Uh, 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 the new number interferes with remembering of the old number this is basically what is called your uh, retroactive interference. So, quick paradigm example learning a new language interferes with ability to remember old language. So, this person here uh, she knows French and these are the French words that she knows and so what happens is uh, after that she learns Spanish. Now, papier and papel both are for paper, liver and or pluma and plume both are for flower and so these kind of things are there which are very similar in the two languages and so what happens is if she learns French first studies uh, uh, Spanish second and Spanish interferes with the uh, learning of French that is why she gets an F in her exam and this is what is called retroactive interference. In proactive interference what happens is opposite of retroactive interference. So, when old memory interferes with new memory. So, in, in retroactive new memory interferes with old memory as, I saw, as we saw that Spanish interferes with French in proactive interference is the, or the opposite. So, old memory keeps on interfering with new memory uh, that is called the proactive interference. And so, in proactive interference what happens is memories of where you parked your car on campus the past week interferes with the ability to park car today. So, what happens is since you have parked this car your car so many times near your or past uh, parked your bicycle in wherever you are reading your department so many times at so many places that that interferes with the fact that where you park today this is what is called proactive interference. And so, this this is it. So, old knowledge hampers because you tend to park at some uh, place and because that was not available you park somewhere else and so the ability to go back or the automaticity which makes you go back into the where place where you used to park and not finding a bicycle is what is called proactive interference. So, old knowledge basically interferes or competes with new knowledge. Now, basically as you saw what happens here is that most both the information are similar type because it is a parking situation in both the cases and so similarity is there. Another theory which talks about uh, the failure or which talks about how retrieval failure happens is called the retrieval Q theory uh, of forgetting. And so, what is the retrieval Q theory? The retrieval Q theory says a clue prompt or hint that can help memory to retract. So, basically when any, any long term memory is formed as I said it is a Q target kind of any kind of a memory is a Q target kind of a system. So, memories generally have something called a key lock kind of a system. So, basically when a memory is stored somewhere in the in the uh, long term store a queue or a key is provided to it and this key fits with this lock the memory and it opens it. So, this queue uh, is the clue or the, lo uh, the key for the memory and the memory is called the lock or that is the store which is there. And so, retrieval queue is very important because if you use the wrong retrieval queue you may not be able to retrieve. Also another feature that you have to know about retrieval queue is that sometimes one memory can have multiple retrieval queues. What do I mean by that? If you want to remember your let us say farewell the 12th class farewell. Now, if that is what you want to remember there are several ways of remembering it. One is the kind of uh, importance you were given there. Another is the kind of feeling that you have on that day may be embarrassed. So, that embarrassment which could make you remember that day or maybe it was uh, the kind of words people said to you or the kind of feeling that you have that day, the kind of shock that you got, the kind of emotionality which was generated and so several events or several events can link to that memory and can bring forth that memory and so multiple cues can link to that memory and each of these cue has a certain weight to it. The most uh, uh, weighted 
uh, I mean to say the most potent Q will have the highest weight. So, basically if my uh, memory that I am talking about is uh, let us say uh, remembering an event and the event is my farewell and there are 4 Q's which uh, can make it remember. For example, the day in terms of what day it was, uh, how I felt that day that is another. So, my feeling my emotion is one way of remembering it or it could be an uh, um, uh, let us say uh, a party an after party which is making it remember or some other event at home which makes me remember it. Now, let us say this emotionality is whenever I think about or whenever I become emotional I remember this farewell. So, it has the highest weight here right and so these have another and so each one of them can think can make you think about this farewell situation, but what would happen is that this is the one which will make you the think more and this is the highest weight. So, basically what is there and similar situation can also occur where one Q can retrieve so many memories. So, there are always uh, all types of things are there. Let us look at this theory. So, retrieval Q is a in this uh, uh, this is what a queue looks like. So, forgetting the result of using improper retrieval queue. If you th um, think about a party and if that is what is retrieving the farewell and what would happen is there you would have so many parties in your life. So, it could be the farewell party, it could be your home party which is there, it could be some other party with your friends which is unrelated to the farewell and so on and so forth. So, if party is the fact or party is the queue that you are using to try to get retrieval, this has the lowest weight right because you may have so many parties, but how you felt that day has the highest weight and so that is the most potent thing. And so, if using improper cue, if thinking of retrieval in some other way in which it was not encoded, if that is what you are trying to retrieve, then that is not possible and so that might not be a good idea of retrieving. So, retrieval uh, forgetting can be basically happening because people do not have the right retrieval cue. Now, with retrieval queue there are two things to look at one is called the recall and the other is called the recognition. There are two uh, retrieval types from long term memory. We will discuss these retrieval and, and uh, recall in detail in the upcoming lectures, but for now let us look into it. So, importance of retrieval queue is evident from recall versus recognition and what is the difference? So, recall test must retrieve information which is learned earlier for example, fill in the blank type of test. So, those tests which ask you to remember something from memory right and as, as demonstrated here fill in the blank type of questions are mostly uh, retrieval or uh, recall kind of a uh, uh, retrieval system. So, here you have to retrieve the actual information which is stored and in recognition test uh, what happens is it is like in answers in front of you, but then you have to basically go ahead and match them. And so, as you will see that recognition has recall inbuilt into it, because only if you recall something, if you are able to recall something, then you will be able to match it. So, basically remember versus no kind of a thing, remember versus no kind of a system. So, I remember something versus I know something. So, for knowing something you have to have this remember uh, for remembering something you have to have the knowing kind of a thing. And so, multiple choice tests are something called uh, recognition test. So, for example, look at this question what is the capital of Finland? No, the no answer is there and so whenever you try to give an answer uh, if, you, if you ever give an answer to that it happens to recall because then you search your memory for it and look at these, <laughs> these are four answers which are given I am pretty sure that you know the answer the answer is Helsinki and so the fin what is the capital of Finland there are four answers. Now, when you are recalling you are doing a free recall. So, you are searching your memory for any information, but in recognition you have to have recall also because you have to recall where, where does these things fit and so recall basically is a part of recognition and so this is what a recognition test looks like and so you will put it to fill uh, Helsinki because all of them now have a probability of a 0 0.25 one fourth probability of being remembering. So, which was easier recall or recognition? Psychological exam would you rather have fill in the blanks or multiple choice and it is be it's best that you have recognition item is basically multiple choice questions are what some which what have been used nowadays everywhere. And so, this is the most potent kind of examination which has been used and so, this is the most prominent kind of a recall that has been or kind of a recall system which is used everywhere nowadays. So, uh, in this lecture we will look into some of the uh, what is how long term memory is uh, designed, what is the way in which it is encoded and what is 
so forgetting how it is stored and what is the forgetting from long term memory or how does this long term memory uh, store information. Thank you.